MOU, Modus Stability. Lesson 1 to 1. Definition of stability, for any mobile offshore unit, MOU or MODU. What is stability? Stability is the ability of a vessel to return to her upright position after being disturbed by any combination of wind, waves, or forces from a towing operation. To maintain positive stability, your vessel, MOU or MOTA should be kept watertight integer at all times. Vertical center of gravity must be below the metacenter and close to the keel. And minimize your slack tanks. Rig Move and Jacking Operations Masterclass. Tailored courses, on demand, on board, anywhere in the world. Recognized certification by the Nautical Institute, London, UK. Thank you very much, for your interest in our courses. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, to make more free lessons possible. Do you have any queries or want to register for a course? Kindly use the email below please. New courses every month. With us, your success is guaranteed. Recognized certification by the Nautical Institute, London, UK. New courses every month. With us, your success is guaranteed. Recognized certification by the Nautical Institute, London, UK. In January of 2006, the tugboat Valor was pulling a barge off the coast of North Carolina when the weather turned bad. 30 knot winds and 10 foot waves buffeted the Valor, and while she should have been up to the challenge, she instead developed a bad list to port and capsized. The Valor, along with three of her crew, was lost. A ship does more than simply sit on top of the water it balances in it. Understanding this balance is critical for ship's officers. They need to know how to keep their vessel upright in the water. A ship's ability to keep itself upright is called stability. What keeps a ship afloat is the force of buoyancy acting upward against the hull, a force equal to the weight of the volume of water it displaces. But there's a twist. The upward force of buoyancy is not in the same place as the downward force of gravity. The relative position of the two is the essential balance that all vessels must find and is the root of their stability. This video will explore this balance and explain how a vessel rests in the water. By taking the time to understand these principles, officers and sailors alike will better understand the stability of their vessel and how to best keep it safely upright. Working up from the basics, this video will build an understanding of where a ship's stability and trim come from. The following are the standard terms used to describe the hull of a ship, even before it is put into the water. These first few terms are fairly basic. Depth is the height of a hull from the highest point of its main deck to its lowest point. In the other direction, a ship's beam, or breadth, is its width at its widest point. The center line is a vertical plane that runs the length of the ship at the midpoint of its beam, and the baseline is a horizontal plane perpendicular to the center line. 
located at the lowest point of the hull. The keel is the principal structural member of a ship, running lengthwise along the center line from bow to stern, to which the ship's frames are attached. The lowest point of the keel, or K, is the point from which vertical distances are measured on a ship. K is located at the intersection of the center line and the baseline. The water line is the intersection of the surface of the water a ship is floating in with the sides of the ship's hull. When a ship is designed, the naval architect determines the design water line, or DWL, that represents the water line of a ship under full load or maximum draft conditions on an even keel. The forward perpendicular, or FP, is a vertical line drawn at the intersection of the design water line and the foreside of the stem of the hull. The after perpendicular, or AP, is a vertical line drawn at the intersection of the design water line and the aftmost point of a ship's hull. For most commercial vessels, this is generally where the rudder post is located. Midships is the horizontal point halfway between the forward and aft perpendiculars, and the length between perpendiculars, or LBP, is the total horizontal distance between the forward and aft perpendiculars. Length overall, or LOA, is the total length of a ship at its longest point. Note that this may be a little longer than the LBP because a ship can extend slightly past the perpendiculars. Distances on board ships are measured in one of three directions, longitudinally, transversely, and vertically. Longitudinal is the horizontal direction along the length of a ship. Longitudinal distances are measured from one of three places, the forward perpendicular, the aft perpendicular, or midships. Where longitudinal measurements are taken from will vary from ship to ship. Transverse is the horizontal direction across the beam of a ship. Transverse distances are measured port or starboard from the center line, with one written as a positive distance and the other as negative. It is not standard which is which, however, and this varies from ship to ship as well. Vertical distances on a ship are measured upward from the baseline or lowest point of the keel. With these terms in mind, we can now look at how a ship interacts with the water. These concepts are the foundation of stability and trim. What holds a ship above the water is the force of buoyancy, a force that equals the weight of the water the ship displaces. Displacement is the amount of water pushed aside or displaced by a ship when it is floating. A ship's displacement is always equal to the total weight and is measured in tons. Depending on your vessel, ship stability can be calculated in either the metric or imperial system, so you must be familiar with both. Displacement was first understood by the Greek thinker Archimedes over 2,000 years ago. The king of Syracuse had asked Archimedes to determine if a crown he had commissioned was pure gold or if the jeweler had cheated him by mixing in some lesser metal. While he was still thinking about it, Archimedes noticed the water in his bathtub rise as he stepped into it. Eureka, he shouted and ran naked into the streets in his excitement. By using displacement, he understood that he could measure the exact volume of the crown. This allowed him to find its density, telling him if the metal was pure or not. It wasn't. Draft is the vertical distance between the water line and the lowest point of the hull. A ship's draft can be found or taken by reading the draft marks that are welded onto a ship's hull forward and aft. Tons per inch of immersion, or TPI, 
is the number of tons necessary to change the draft of a vessel by one inch. In the metric system, this is tons per centimeter of immersion, or TPC. Load lines are marks welded on the side of a vessel's hull at midships, showing the draft under maximum safe loading conditions. This mark is called the plimsoll mark. If a vessel is overloaded and its draft is deeper than its load line, it is unsafe and is in violation of the International Load Line Convention. It will be subject to fines or other legal actions and its insurance is void. Trim is the difference in draft, forward and aft. The trim of a vessel can be found by reading the draft marks on its hull. These draft marks are placed as close to the perpendiculars as the shape of the hull allows. A vessel's freeboard is the vertical distance between the waterline and the highest watertight deck of the hull, usually the main deck. Freeboard is important because it is part of what determines the volume of the space above the waterline. The waterplane area, or AWP, of a vessel is the horizontal intersection of the waterplane and the vessel's sides. The bigger a vessel's waterplane area is, the greater the surface of the hull is that buoyancy will be acting against. For this reason, in the case of two vessels with the same weight added, the one with the greater waterplane area will have a smaller change in draft. As a vessel rolls in the water, its waterplane area increases as long as there is freeboard available to add to it. The larger a vessel's waterplane area becomes when it rolls, the more buoyant force it develops. This is why freeboard is indicative of a ship's reserve buoyancy, or additional buoyancy at larger angles of roll. Longitudinal center of flotation, or LCF, is the geometric center of the waterplane area. The LCF is the point about which the vessel trims. Note that the LCF is not necessarily located at midships. Its location is determined by the shape of the waterplane area and the trim of the vessel. Stability is the tendency of a vessel to right itself. When a vessel is tilted by an outside force, such as wind or waves, and it returns to its original position, it has positive stability. If it does not, it has neutral or negative stability. The center of gravity, or G, is the single point where the downward force of gravity acts. The center of gravity is the combined effect of the position and weight of everything on board a vessel. The center of gravity moves toward any added weight, away from any removed weight, and in the same direction as any shift in weight. On a properly managed vessel, the center of gravity should be maintained on the center line for maximum stability. Because it is a point in three-dimensional space, there are three coordinates used to describe its position. The vertical center of gravity, or VCG, or KG, is measured upward from the keel. The transverse center of gravity, TCG, is measured from the center line. The longitudinal center of gravity, LCG, is usually measured from the forward perpendicular, or from midships. Understanding where a vessel's center of gravity is located and how it moves is vital for a ship's officer because it is the one property of a ship's stability that they have the most control over. As cargo is loaded or ballast tanks are filled, the center of gravity moves accordingly. How well an officer understands this principle will keep his vessel afloat in heavy weather. The center of buoyancy, or B, is the single point where the upward force of buoyancy acts. It is located at the geometric center of the displaced volume, or the area of hull beneath the waterline. When a ship rolls in the water, the shape of the area beneath the waterline changes. The center of buoyancy is constantly moving to stay in the center of that area. 
The key to understanding stability is understanding how the center of buoyancy moves. G and B have equal force acting in opposite directions. As a vessel rolls, the distance between the downward force of G and the upward force of B creates a righting moment that returns the vessel to the upright position. A moment is nothing more than a force or weight multiplied by its distance from a particular point. Think of it as a lever. A moment can have a greater effect because the distance increases or because the force increases. In the imperial system, moments are measured in foot tons. The effect of the longitudinal difference between G and B is trim. Trim is defined as the difference between the forward and after drafts. The opposing forces of G and B across the trim arm create a trimming moment that causes the vessel to trim around the LCF. Keep in mind that the deeper draft of a ship's trim will always be on the same side of the trim arm as the LCG. If the LCG is forward of the LCB, then the forward draft increases. If LCG is aft of LCB, then the after draft increases. Moment to trim one inch, or MT1, is the moment to change the trim of a vessel by one inch. In the metric system, this is the moment to trim one centimeter, or MTC. These final concepts are the core of ship stability and trim. Every officer needs a working knowledge of these terms in order to understand the stability of their vessel. Heel is the angle a ship assumes as a result of an outside force, such as wind or waves. Unlike heel, a vessel is said to list if it is resting in the water at an angle without an outside influence. Normally, this is due to what is called an asymmetrical load, an uneven load that causes a vessel's center of gravity to move off of the center line. A list should be quickly and easily corrected. As we've seen, when a vessel rolls, B moves in the direction of the roll and out from under G. The metacenter, or M, is the intersection of the upward force of B when a vessel is upright and when it is at an angle. Think of it as the center of the arc that B moves through as a vessel rolls in the water, like the anchoring point of a pendulum. It is considered to be on the center line at small angles of heel. The location of the meta center is provided for the ship's officers by the naval architect and is a key value in calculating stability. The vertical distance between the center of buoyancy and the meta center is called the metacentric radius, or BM. Once there is a horizontal distance between the center of gravity and the metacentric radius, the opposing forces of gravity and buoyancy create a righting moment that returns the vessel to its upright position. This horizontal distance is called the righting arm, or GZ. The righting moment, the rotational force that rights the ship, is the length of the righting arm multiplied by the vessel's total displacement. Km is the vertical position of M, measured upward from the keel. Metacentric height, or GM, is the vertical distance between G and M. When we put these things together, we see the ship's stability triangle. This shows us that the larger the GM is, the longer the writing arm, or GZ, will be. The longer the writing arm is, the greater the force of the writing moment will be, and the ship will have a greater ability to write itself. For this reason, GM is used as the standard measure of a ship's initial stability. This is the stability for small angles of heel, usually less than 7 or 10 degrees. When a ship heals any more than that, 
its meta center moves off of the center line and stability becomes a more complex problem. Initial stability is still used as the standard measure of a vessel's stability, however, because if a vessel has enough initial stability, it is believed to have sufficient stability for larger angles of roll. Knowing the fundamentals and terminology of stability is just the beginning. Once you're comfortable with the terms of stability, you can begin to understand the stability calculations required of every officer. As you continue to study stability, you will become familiar with the hydrostatic tables provided for your ship and use them to help you find its required stability. You will use initial stability to determine your ship's overall stability, as well as range of stability, maximum writing arm, and danger angle. Understanding the stability of your ship is the key to making every voyage a safe one. A vessel's stability should never be taken for granted. Many assume the naval architect took care of it in the ship's design. Most crew members give it little thought. A responsible officer does not have this luxury and must always be aware of their ship's motion and understand what it means. Yes, firefighting, housekeeping, and navigation are very important, but none of it matters on a ship that can't stay on top of the water. Only when your ship is upright and stable are you in a position to deal with anything else the sea throws at you. In this video, we're going to get introduced to the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem, which is fun on its own, but you'll see as you learn more and more mathematics, it's one of those cornerstone theorems of, of, of really all of math. It's useful in geometry. It's kind of the backbone of trigonometry. You're also going to use it to calculate distances between points. So it's a good thing to, to really make sure we know well. So let, let enough talk on my end. Let me tell you what the Pythagorean theorem is. So if we have a triangle, and the triangle has to be a right triangle. So it has to be a right triangle, which means that one of the three angles in the triangle have to be 90 degrees. And you specify that it's 90 degrees by drawing that little box right there. So that right there is, let me do this in a different color, that right there is a 90 degree, 90 degree angle. Or we could call it a right, a right angle. And a triangle that has a right angle in it is called a right triangle. So this is called a right, right triangle. Now, with the Pythagorean theorem, if we know two sides of a right triangle, we can always figure out the third side. And before I show you how to do that, let me give you one more piece of terminology. The longest side of a Pythagorean of a of a right triangle is the side opposite the 90 degree angle or opposite the right angle. So in this case it is this side right here. This is the longest side. It, it, the way to tell where, figure out where that right triangle is and you kind of it opens into that longest side. That longest side is called the hypotenuse hypotenuse and it's good to know cuz we'll keep referring to it and i just just so we always are good at identifying the hypotenuse let me draw a couple of more right triangles so let's say i have a triangle that looks like that a triangle that looks let me draw it a little bit nicer so let's say i have a triangle that looks like that and i were to tell you that this angle right here is 90 degrees in this situation this is the hypotenuse cuz it is opposite it is opposite the 90 degree angle. It is the longest side. Let me do one more, just so that we're good at recognizing the hypotenuse. So let's say that that is my triangle. And this is the 90 degree angle right there. And I think you know how to do this already. You go right what it opens into. That is the hypotenuse. That is the longest side. The longest side. So that is the hypotenuse. 
So once you have identified the hypotenuse, and let's say that that has length c, and now we're going to learn what the Pythagorean theorem tells us. So let's say that c is equal to the length of the hypotenuse. So let's call this c. That side is c. Let's call this side right over here. Let's call this side right over here a. And let's call this side over here b. So the Pythagorean theorem tells us that a squared, so one of the shorter sides, the length of one of the shorter sides squared, plus the length of the other shorter side squared, is going to be equal to the length of the hypotenuse squared. Now, let's do that with an actual problem, and you'll see that it's actually not so bad. So let's say that I have a triangle that looks like this. Let me draw it. Let's say that this is my triangle. Looks something like this. And let's say that they tell us that this is the right angle, that this length right here, let me do this in different colors, this length right here is 3, and that this length right here is 4. And they want us to figure out they want us to figure out that length right there. Now the first thing you want to do before you even apply the Pythagorean theorem is to make sure you have your hypotenuse straight. You, you make sure you know what you're solving for. And in this circumstance, we're solving for the hypotenuse. And we know that because this side over here, it is the side opposite, opposite the right angle. If we look at the Pythagorean theorem, this is c. This is the longest side. So now we're ready to apply. We're ready to apply the Pythagorean theorem. It tells us that 4 squared, one of the shorter sides, plus 3 squared, plus 3 squared, the square of another of the shorter sides, is going to be equal to this longer side squared. The hypotenuse squared is going to be equal to c squared. And then you just solve for c. So 4 squared is the same thing as 4 times 4. That is 16. And 3 squared is the same thing as 3 times 3, so that is 9. And that is going to be equal to, is equal to c squared. Now what is 16 plus 9? It's 25. So 25 is equal to c squared. And we could take the positive square root of both sides. C, I guess, just if you look at it mathematically, could be negative 5 as well. But we're dealing with distances, so we only care about the positive roots. So you take the principal root of both sides, and you get 5 is equal to c. Or the length of the longest side is equal to, is equal to 5. Now, you could use a Pythagorean theorem if, if we give you two of the sides to figure out the third side, no matter what the third side is. So let's do another one right over here. Let's say, let's say that our triangle looks like Let's say our triangle looks something like let's say our triangle looks like this and that is our right angle. Let's say that this side over here has length 12 and let's say that this side over here has length 6 and we want to figure out we want to figure out this length right over there. Now, like I said, the first thing you want to do is identify the hypotenuse and that's going to be the side opposite the right angle. We have the right angle here. You go opposite the right angle. The longest side, the hypotenuse, is right there. So if we think about the, if we think about the Pythagorean theorem, that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, 12 you could view as c. This is the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse, the c squared is the hypotenuse squared. So you could say 12 is equal to c. And then we could set these sides. It doesn't matter whether you call one of them a or one of them b. So let's just call this side right here. Let's say a is equal to 6. And then we say b, this colored b, is equal to question mark. And now we can apply the Pythagorean theorem. a squared, which is 6 squared, 6 squared, plus the unknown b squared, plus b squared, is equal to the hypotenuse squared, is equal to c squared, is equal to 12 squared. And now we can solve for b. And notice the difference here. Now we're not solving for the hypotenuse. We're solving for one of the shorter sides. In the last example, we solved for the hypotenuse. We solved for c. So that's why it's always important to recognize that the a squared plus b squared plus c squared, c is the length of the hypotenuse. Let's just solve for b here. So we get 6 squared is 36 plus b squared 
plus b squared is equal to 12 squared, that's 12 times 12, is 144. Now we can subtract 36 from both sides of this equation. Subtract 36, those cancel out. On the left hand side, we're left with just a b squared is equal to, now 144 minus 36 is what? That is 144 minus 30 is 114, and then you might subtract 6 is 108. So this is going to be 108. So that's what b squared is, and now we want to take the principal root or the positive root of both sides, and you get b is equal to the square root, the principal root of 108. Now let's see if we can simplify this a little bit. The square root of 108, and what we could do is we could take the prime factorization of 108 and see how we can simplify this radical. So 108 is the same thing as, let's see, it's the same thing as 2 times 54, which is the same thing as 2 times 27 which is the same thing as 3 times 9. So we have the square root, square root of 108 is the same thing as the square root of 2 times 2 times, actually, I, I'm not done. 9 can be factorized into 3 times 3. So it's 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 times 3. And so we have a couple of perfect squares in here. Let me rewrite it a little bit neater. And this is all an exercise in simplifying radicals that you will bump into a lot while doing the Pythagorean theorem, so it doesn't hurt to do it right here. So this is the same thing as so this is the same thing as the square root of two times two times three times three times the square root of that last three right over there. And this is the same thing. And you know, you would you wouldn't have to do all of this in your head. Well, all of this on paper, you could do it in your head. What is this? Two times two is four. Four times nine. This is thirty-six. This is the square root of thirty-six times the square root of three. The principal root of thirty-six is six. So this simplifies to six square roots of three. So the length of b you could write a square root of 108, or you could say it's equal to 6 times the square root of 3. This is 12, this is 6, and the square root of 3, well, this is going to be a 1 point something something, so it's going to be a little bit larger than 6. Let's say we have a right triangle. So let me draw my right triangle just like that. This is our right triangle. This is the 90 degree angle right here. And we're told that this, this side's length right here is 14. This side's length right over here is 9. And we're told that this side is a. And we need to find the length of a. So as I mentioned already, this is a right triangle. And we know that if we have a right triangle, we can always figure out, if we know two of the sides, we can always figure out a third side using the Pythagorean theorem. And what the Pythagorean theorem tells us is that the sum of the squares of the shorter sides is going to be equal to the square of the longer side, or the square of the hypotenuse. And if you're not sure about that, you're probably thinking, hey, Sal, how do I know that a is shorter than this side over here? How do I know it's not 15 or 16? And the way to tell is that the longest side in a right triangle, this only applies to a right triangle, is the side opposite the 90 degree angle. And in this case, 14 is opposite the 90 degrees. This 90 degree angle kind of opens into this longest side, the side that we call the hypotenuse. So now that we know that that's the longest side, let me color code it. So this is the longest side. This is one of the shorter sides. And this is the other of the shorter sides. The Pythagorean theorem tells us that the sum of the squares of the shorter sides, so a squared plus 9 squared plus 9 squared, is going to be equal to 14 squared. And it's really important that you realize that it's not 9 squared plus 14 squared is going to be equal to a squared. a squared is one of the shorter sides. The sum of the squares of these two sides are going to be equal to 14 squared, the hypotenuse squared. And from here, we just have to solve for a. So we get a squared plus 81 plus 81 is equal to 14 squared. And in case we don't know what that is, let's just multiply it out. 14 times 14. 4 times 4 is 16. 
4 times 1 is 4, plus 1 is 5. Stick a 0 there. 1 times 4 is 4. 1 times 1 is 1. 6 plus 0 is 6. 5 plus 4 is 9. Bring down the 1. It's 196. So a squared plus 81 is equal to 14 squared, which is 196. Then we could subtract 81 from both sides of this equation. Let's subtract 81 from both sides. On the left-hand side, we're going to be left with just the a squared. These two guys cancel out. Whole point of subtracting 81. So we're left with a squared is equal to 196 minus 81. 196 minus 81. What is that? See, 190. So that if you just subtract 1, 195. If you subtract 80, it'd be 115. If I'm doing that right, right, it would be 100. And 15. And then to solve for a, we just take the square root of both sides, the principal square root, the positive square root of both sides of this equation. So let's do that, because we're dealing with distances. You can't have a negative square root or a negative distance here. And we get a is equal to the square root of 115. a is equal to the square root of 115. And let's see if we can break down 115 any further. So let's see, it's clearly divisible by 5. It's a fa if you factor it out, it's 5. And then what does it divide? 5 goes into 115 23 times. 23 times. So both of these are prime numbers, so we're done. So you actually can't factor this anymore. So a is just going to be equal to the square root of 115. Now if you want to get a sense of roughly how large the square root of 115 is, if you think about it, the square root of 100 is equal to 10, and the square root of 121 is equal to 11. So this value right here is going to be someplace in between 10 and 11, which makes sense if you, if you think about it visually. We're asked to solve the right triangle shown below. Give the lengths to the nearest tenth. So when they say solve the right triangle, we can assume that they're saying, hey, figure out the lengths of all the sides. So whatever a is equal to, whatever b is equal to. And also, what are all the angles of the right triangle? We get, they've given two of them. We might have to figure out this third right over here. So there's multiple ways to tackle this. But we'll just go and we'll just try to tackle side xw first, try to figure out what a is. And I'll give you a hint. You can use a calculator, and using a calculator, you can use your trigonometric functions that we've looked at a good bit now. So I'll give you a few seconds to think about how to figure out what a is. Well, what do we know? We know this angle y right over here. We know the side adjacent to angle y. And length a, this is the side, that's the length of the side that is opposite, that is opposite to angle y. So what trigonometric ratio? What trigonometric ratio deals with the opposite and the adjacent? So if we're looking at angle y, relative to angle y, this is the opposite. And this right over here is the adjacent. Well, if we don't remember, we can go back to Sokotoa. Sokotoa. Sine deals with opposite and hypotenuse. Cosine deals with adjacent and hypotenuse. Tangent deals with opposite over adjacent opposite over adjacent. So we can say that the tangent, the tangent of 65 degrees of that angle of 65 degrees is equal to the opposite, the length of the opposite side, which we know has length a, over the length of the adjacent side, which they gave us in the diagram, which has length, which has length 5. And you might say, well, how do I figure out a? Well, we can use our calculator to evaluate what the tangent of 65 degrees are, and then we can solve for a. And actually, if we just want to get the expression explicitly solving for a, we can just multiply both sides of this equation times 5. So let's do that. 5 times times 5. These cancel out. And we are left with, if we flip the, the equal around, we're left with a is equal to 5 times the tangent of 65 of 65 degrees. So now we can get our calculator out and figure out what this is to the nearest tenth. I get the, my handy TI-85 out, and I have five times the not the, the tangent. No, I, I didn't need to press that second right over there. Just the regular tangent of 65 degrees, and I am I get. 
If I round to the nearest tenth, like they asked me to, I get 10.7. So this is, so A is approximately equal to 10.7. I say approximately because I rounded it, I rounded it down. I didn't, this is not the exact number, but A is equal to 10.7. So we now know that this has length 10.7 approximately. There's several ways that we can try to tackle B. And I'll let you pick the way you want to, but then I'll just do it the way I would like to. So my next question to you is, what is the length of the side YW? Or what is the value of B? Well, there's several ways to do it. This is the hypotenuse, so we could use trigonometric functions that deal with adjacent over hypotenuse or opposite over hypotenuse. Or we could just use the Pythagorean theorem. We know two sides of a right triangle. We can come up with the third side. I will go with, I will go with using trigonometric ratios, since that's what we've been working on a good bit. So this length b, that's the length of the hypotenuse. So this side wy is the hypotenuse. And so what trigonometric ratios, and we can decide what we want to use. We could use opposite in hypotenuse. We could use adjacent in hypotenuse. Since we know that xy is exactly 5, and we don't have to deal with this approximation, let's use that side. So what trigonometric ratios deal with adjacent and hypotenuse? Well, we see from Sokotoa, cosine deals with adjacent over hypotenuse. So we could say that the cosine of 65 degrees, cosine of 65 degrees, is equal to the length of the adjacent side, which is 5, over the length of the hypotenuse, which has length b. And then we can try to solve for b. You multiply both sides times b. You're left with b times cosine of 65 degrees is equal to 5. And then to solve for b, you can divide both sides by cosine of 65 degrees. This is just a number here, so we're just dividing. We have to figure it out with our calculator, but this is just going to evaluate to some number. So we can divide both sides by that, by cosine of 65 degrees, cosine of 65 degrees, and we're left with b is equal to 5 over the cosine of 65 degrees. So let us now use our calculator to figure out the length of b. The length of b is 5 divided by cosine of 65 degrees. And I get, if I round to the nearest tenth, 11.8. So b is approximately equal to, rounded to the nearest tenth, 11.8. So b is equal to 11.8. And then we're almost done solving this right triangle. And you could have figured this out using the Pythagorean theorem as well, saying that 5 squared plus 10.7 squared should be equal to b squared, and hopefully you would get the exact same answer. And the last thing we have to figure out is the measure of angle w. Angle w right over here. So I'll give you a few seconds to think about what the measure of angle w is. Well, here we just have to remember that the sum of the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. So angle w plus 65 degrees, that's this angle right up here, plus the right angle, this is a right triangle, they're going to add up to 180 degrees. So all we need to do is, well, we could simplify the left-hand side right over here. 65 plus 90 is 155. So angle W plus 155 degrees is equal to 180 degrees. And then we get angle W, if we subtract 155 from both sides, angle W is equal to 25 degrees. And we are done solving the right triangle shown below. We have seen that the metacentric height can be used as a measure of initial stability. We also have seen that changes in GM affect the entire stability curve. In this pontoon, for example, 
A change in the position of G changes not only the initial stability, but the range of stability as well. The center of gravity is at the approximate center of the pontoon. With this GM, it may be seen that the resistance to inclination is fairly good. For when the small weight is moved outboard, the pontoon will take a list of only about 12 degrees. It can also be seen that with this GM, the point of vanishing stability, or point at which it will capsize, is about 90 degrees. However, by the shifting of weight downward, GM of the pontoon is increased. The range of stability is improved. The topside weight in the off-center position now produces only a negligible amount of list. And the pontoon can now be inclined to about 140 degrees before it will capsize. Conversely, by shifting the weight high enough, to produce a very small GM, the stability of the pontoon is so impaired that a shift of the topside weight away from the center line now is sufficient to capsize it. It should be noted that up to now, all changes of GM have been accomplished solely by a shift of the position of G, the displacement having remained constant. However, when a smaller weight is substituted at the center of gravity of the pontoon, its displacement changes. As a result, GM is changed by a shift of the position of M without changing the position of G. When the draft is decreased through the reduction of weight, the elliptical path of buoyancy expands. And the curvature for small angles of inclination places the metacenter higher. On the other hand, if the draft is increased through the addition of weight, the elliptical path of buoyancy contracts, placing the metacenter lower. A change of GM brought about by adding or subtracting weight may affect stability differently than a change of GM when the weight is constant. When the original weight was centered in the pontoon and the topside weight moved outboard, the pontoon took a list of 12 degrees indicating good stability. However, when a smaller weight is substituted inside the pontoon, the draft is reduced. Raising the position of M thereby increasing GM. But the stability of the pontoon is now impaired, for while the GM is now greater, the weight is smaller. And it must be remembered that the value of the writing moment is the length of the writing arm multiplied by the weight.
The loss of stability becomes evident when the top side weight is moved outboard. For now, instead of 12 degrees, a list of 25 degrees is produced. The importance of weight, as well as GM, in the evaluation of the stability of a vessel can be seen in the following examples. A naval vessel leaving port, fully loaded, carries a large amount of fuel oil, ammunition, and ship stores. In this full load condition, the vessel, represented here schematically, has a displacement of 16,500 tons and a draft of 27 feet. The shape of the underwater volume places the metacenter approximately 29 feet above the keel. Due to the distribution of the weight, the center of gravity is 24 and one-half feet above the keel. The GM, therefore, in the full load condition, is four and one-half feet. Referring to the stability curve for full load condition, it may be seen that when the ship is inclined to eight degrees, a writing arm of six-tenths of one foot is produced. By multiplying the weight of the ship, 16,500 tons, by six-tenths of a foot, a writing moment of 9,900 foot-tons is obtained. The maximum writing arm for this condition of loading is produced at an angle of 45 degrees. Multiplying the ship's displacement, 16,500 tons, by the writing arm, four and three-tenths feet, at this angle of inclination, we learn that the maximum writing moment is almost 71,000 foot-tons. Now, let us follow this particular ship through a cruise and see how changing conditions of load affect her stability. After some time at sea, the fuel supply is reduced and some of the stores have been used up. In this medium load condition, the displacement is 14,700 tons. Therefore, the draft has been reduced, resulting in a slight shift of M. The loss of weight, however, has occurred low in the ship, causing the center of gravity to rise. The net effect of these two changes is to reduce GM from four and one half to three and two tenths feet. Now, at an angle of eight degrees, a writing arm of one half a foot is produced. Again, multiplying the writing arm by the ship's displacement, we find that the writing moment at this angle has been reduced from 9,900 foot tons to 7,350 foot tons. The maximum arm in this condition of loading occurs at approximately the same angle, 45 degrees, but has been reduced to four feet. The maximum writing moment, then, for the medium load condition is 58,800 foot-tons as against 71,000 foot-tons in the full load condition. Stability has been decreased, but still is adequate. We come now to the light condition. The ship has seen some action. In bombarding shore establishments, most of the ammunition has been expended. Therefore, the magazines are virtually empty. More fuel and more stores have been used. The displacement is now only 10,600 tons. With the draft thus reduced to 18 and a half feet, the metacenter rises to 30 feet above the keel. 
But due to the loss of weight low in the ship, G also rises, resulting in a GM of only one and one-half feet. Now, this represents a poor stability condition for this particular ship. It must not be assumed, however, that this represents poor stability for all ships, because some, such as destroyers, are designed to have good stability with a GM as low as one and one-half feet. In this condition, the writing moment at eight degrees is 2,650 foot-tons as against 9,900 foot-tons when the vessel left port. And the maximum writing moment is now less than half of the original value of 71,000 foot-tons. At this point in our cruise, it is apparent that the ship's stability has been considerably reduced. To regain stability, the center of gravity can be lowered and the ship's displacement increased by ballasting empty fuel oil bottoms with seawater. This will restore the ship to a condition equivalent to the medium load condition, in which fairly good stability is assured. Failure to ballast in a light condition may result in a dangerous situation. Suppose, for instance, that heading for port, we used up most of the remaining fuel and stores. And at the same time, weather conditions cause the ship to ice up. The added weight topside and the loss of weight low in the ship would cause G to climb above M. With a small negative GM, a ship will not remain upright. It will heel to one side or the other. This behavior may be understood by studying the change in position of the metacenter relative to the fixed center of gravity. In the upright position, with M vertically below G, the vessel is in unstable equilibrium. It heels over until M is vertically above G. And the vessel at this inclined position is in stable equilibrium. Further inclination produces writing arms which tend to return the vessel to the new position of equilibrium. The overall stability is considerably reduced, as seen in the ship's stability curve. The arms are upsetting arms up to 18 degrees, the new position of equilibrium. And the writing arms beyond that point are considerably shorter than they were. If the icing up continues, more weight is added high and G climbs still higher. G may climb so high that no matter what the angle of inclination, M never moves to a position vertically above G. Consequently, all of the arms are upsetting arms. And the ship capsizes. The metacentric height provides an invaluable gauge for measuring the initial stability of a vessel. For when only the GM is known... It may be used to evaluate the resistance of a vessel to initial inclination. 
When GM is decreased, resistance to initial inclination will be decreased proportionately. Because the rate of growth of writing arms for small angles of heel will be decreased in proportion to the decrease of GM. But as we have seen, GM should always be considered in conjunction with the displacement of a vessel. Because the writing moment, which is the weight multiplied by the writing arm, is a true measure of stability. And while GM is a measure of the growth of writing arms for small angles of heel only, any change of GM will change the value of the writing arms at all angles of inclination. And therefore will affect not only initial stability, but the maximum writing arm and the range of stability as well.